so yeah, this is internal server error, exploiting interprocess communication with new desynchronization primitives. Please welcome Martin Doinehard. Hello everyone, <coughs> welcome to internal server error, exploiting interprocess communication with new desynchronization primitives. My name is Martin Doinehard, I'm a security researcher at Onapsis which is a company focused on enterprise software security. And among the different uh, enterprise software developers, SAP is probably the most popular one with over 400,000 customers, and this includes 90% of Fortune 500 companies. <coughs> most of the services that SAP provides are for managing business processes, such as financials, operations, human capital, customer relationships, supply chain, and many other, uh, manage, many other software that manage the critical assets of a company. And to do so, they provide a lot of modules that are based on web services that are accessible through HTTP. And this is true for both Java and ABAP, and also for S4HANA and the cloud. And to expose these kind of services, they use the same proprietary HTTP server in all their products, which is called the Internet Communication Manager. <coughs> and so what is this Internet Communication Manager, or ICM? Well, it's a component that is used to handle all the communication with the outside world and with the SAP system, and this includes uh, all communication with clients, such as um, different employees or customers, also with other systems and with other SAP systems. Among the different protocols that can be used, there is a P4, which is a proprietary protocol similar to RMA, also IOP, SMTP, but the main purpose of this uh, the Internet Communication Manager is to handle the HTTP and HTTPS uh, communications. And <coughs> this is really important. This is the component that will be exposed and it will be present by default in all SAP installations in the world. Therefore, we will find it in all SAP products and it is quite important and that's why I decided to make a research on this because anytime we find an SAP, the, the, service, the HTTP service will be exposed and we will find many SAP systems exposing this to the internet. <coughs> but before I can find any vulnerability, I needed to understand how this uh, internet communication manager worked and of course we don't have the source code that is not before because SAP does not like open source. They, they know this will, that would kill the fun, so <coughs> I had to reverse engineer the entire uh, component. And you can see that SAP provides us with a small diagram which says not too much about this, uh, the architecture. We can see some components, but it's not really descriptive, so I had to make an, a small abstraction of this diagram so that you understand how this works. Also, I will abstract a lot of internals. If you want to learn more or want you to know more about this, you can ask me later or you can write me through my Twitter or see the white paper. So first, we will say that the ICM is, uh, is the HTTP server that will receive connections from clients. And when a client starts a TCP connection, and a worker thread, which is an internal thread from the process, will be, will be assigned to this TCP connection. And the idea is that this worker thread handles all the requests and responses for, for this cli specific client. So when a client sends a request, uh, it will be received by the worker thread, which will use the HTTP parser to understand the request. Then it will use some internal HTTP handlers, which I will talk later about them, and to try to resolve this request internally. And if it's not possible to do it, which is, will be the, the, in most cases that will be the case, um, it will send the request to another process. And this is because the business logic of the, um, of the NSAP is not inside the ICM. It's actually programmed in Java or ABAP. Therefore, it will be sent to another process. And to do so, it will use something that is called memory pipes, which I will also explain in a minute, <coughs> to efficiently send this data to the other process, which is called the worker process which will generate a response, send it back through, uh, through these memory pipes to the ICM, and the ICM will forward it to the client. So again, what are these memory pipes? Well, MPI how is how SAP call it. It's a framework that supports the exchange of data between the SAP and, <coughs> any, uh, and the worker process, which can be Java or ABAP. So the idea is this framework will be used to send the data 
but not to copy all the requests and responses because that wouldn't be any efficient. So <coughs> the, the MPI uses the shared memory to do so. So it will use MPI buffers which are just fixed size uh, buffers of 65 kilobytes and they will be stored in the shared memory and instead of sending the entire request and response and copying from one process to another, it will just send a pointer which is called an MPI pointer to from to these uh, MPI buffers. It will use the MPI handler which is a class that will manage all these uh, communications. So let's see an example. <coughs> First, when a request arrives to the ICM, actually to the worker thread, the input output handler will receive this. This is just a TCP socket that will have an internal buffer to store every everything that comes from the internet. And when the ICM worker thread is ready to to receive and handle a request, it will first uh, reserve an MPI buffer. Then it will store the request there. This is all going to be done using the MPI handler. And now when it will use the HTTP parser, then the it will try to resolve the request using internal handlers and if it fails, it will send the request to the worker process. This is going to be done by sending just the MPI pointer and now the Java or Ava process will have a reference to this request. Then it will generate a response and it will also reserve a new MPI buffer which will store the response. Then it will send the MPI pointer back to the worker thread and the worker thread will forward this response back to the client. Then all the MPI, both MPI buffers will be freed one by one and then the references will be lost. <coughs> so I also said that there are some internal handlers that are going to be used to try to resolve the request and they are inside the ACM, they are actually functions that will try to uh, generate a response out of uh, a request and they will be included when, when a request arrives, sorry, they will be, there will be a, a list of handlers that will be used. And the, the component that will decide which handlers should be included is the HTTP parser. So it will see at the URL and depending on, on the URL, it will know which uh, handlers should be included in the list and then those handlers will try to resolve the request. So when an internal handler is able to resolve a request, actually when any handler is able to resolve a request, the other handlers will be will be deleted from this list and the response will be sent back to the to the client. So first we have the cache handler. I'm going to to show the handlers in order as they are being called when they are included in the list. So first we have the cache handler. This is present by default and it's always included in the list no matter what the URL is. It's always included in the handlers list. And the cache handler will do what we all expect. It will try to resolve the request by looking at the cache and if it has a store object for that URL, then it will return the, the response back to the client. Then we have the admin handler and the authentication handler. They are both going to be called, uh, they are both present by default, sorry, but they are only going to be called depending on the URL and if, it's, if the pattern is correct. So for the admin handler, there is a prefix being slash SAP slash admin and for the authentication handler we will have some hard coded values in the ICM that will be used to know if the handler should be included or not. Then we have the <coughs> modification handler, the file access handler and the redirect handler. They are not present by default. They need to be set in a, in a configuration file before the SAP starts so we are not going to see more about them. And finally we will have the Java and the ABAP handler that depends on how the system is configured and they also are going to be always included by default but they are not going to try to resolve the request internally they will just send the request to the worker process. As you can see there is a specific function for each of these handlers. We also have other handlers like the log handler but that's not really interesting for us because it cannot re uh, generate a response out of our request. So let's see an example of how a request is resolved using internal handlers. Again, when a request arrives, it will be stored in the input output handler. And in this case, we see that the request is a get to slash SAP slash admin. Again, the worker thread will try to, will reserve a new MPI buffer. It will place their request there. And now the HTTP parser will start calling different handlers. We'll actually include these handlers in the list. First, the cache handler as always, because it's always uh, included. Then in this case the admin handler because of the slash SAP slash admin prefix and then the Java or ABAP handler depending on the worker process uh, that is going to be used. 
Now, the cache handler is going to be called. In this case, let's say it fails, it cannot resolve the request. So in this case, the admin handler is also going to be called after this. And in this case, we see that we can we obtain a response out of the cache handler. So this is not going to be placed in the shared memory because it's not necessary. We will not send it to the worker process. The response is going to be placed in uh, in the heap, and then this will be forwarded. The, all the other handles will be deleted, and it, this will be hand, uh, forwarded to the client. Again, the MPI buffer will be freed, and the reference will be lost. So as I said, MPI buffers are fixed size. This means that they can only uh, hold 60, uh, 65 kilobytes of data. So what if we send a longer request, okay? And I'm going to call this a long request even though it's not that long, it's just 65 kilobytes. But what if we send something that cannot be uh, fit inside the MPI uh, buffer? So let's see an example. We send a request with a content length of 66,000 uh, bytes. And the ICM will first reserve an MPI buffer as always, and it will only place this first 65 kilobytes uh, of the request that has received has arrived from the client. And this is because the internal handlers are supposed to to resolve requests that does not contain body, that are just simple requests with some sp special headers. And so the the ICM is not expecting to use the rest of the body or the rest of the request until the worker process is required. So again, the HTTP parser will read the request, will call some handlers. In this case, the cache handler is not able to resolve the request. And so when the Java Riva process uh, is, is called, so when we send this request to the worker process, then in this case, we will need the rest of the request because the, of course, the Java Riva process will use the body of our request and the business uh, logic needs this kind of data. So the ICM will reserve as many MPI buffers as required it will store the rest of the request there and it will send all the MPI pointers to the worker process. Now the worker process will have a reference and will use them to generate a response and again it will the, uh, the worker process will reserve an MPI buffer, store the response, send it to the worker thread and the worker thread will forward this response back to the client. And now as I said previously, um, these MPI buffers are going to be freed one by one when we have a simple re request. However, when we have a multi buffer request, the MPI free all buffer function is going to be called, which will delete or will free all the MPI buffers that are associated with this worker thread. And then the references will be lost. So let's see at the first vulnerability. As I said, um, the worker thread is not expecting to use uh, or to resolve a request um, we using the body because internal handlers shouldn't shouldn't use that kind of the, the information. But what if we send a long request that is not handled by the worker process, but instead is handled by an internal handler? So again, as, as I already explained, we will see. Uh, in this case, we have a get request to slash sap slash admin and it's a long request containing 66,000 bytes. Therefore, only the first 65 kilobytes will be stored in an MPI buffer, and then the parser will include these different handlers. The cache handler again will fail, but in this case, the admin handler was able to generate a response. So this response will again be sent to the client, then all the handlers will be removed, the MPI, point <coughs> the MPI buffer will be freed, and the request response cycle will be completed. But as you can see, we have more data from the previous request in the input output handler. So now when the worker thread tries to read a new request, it will consider this as, of course, a new isolated request. So if you know something about the HTTP synchronization, which I hope you do if you came to this talk, uh, you know that this is a vulnerability and a serious one. And this is because <coughs> whenever we send this kind of, of request that you can see in the slides, which contains um, a get request to SAP slash SAP slash admin, it will be resolved by an internal handler, as we saw, and <coughs> actually the proxy will forward this as an entire as an entire request without seeing any any problem. And this is because we don't have nothing that tells the proxy that this is a special request. Actually, it is uh, HTTP RFC compliance compliance, so there is no problem. 
it's just a get request with a big content length, but the entire body is included in that uh, content length. But when this request arrives to the ICM, it will be split it and the last part which is the get to smuggle will be used as an isolated request therefore it will be a desynchronization between the proxy any proxy in the world because again any proxy will see this as an isolated request and the ICM. And this is a serious vulnerability it's actually a CVSS 10 because it was uh, it allow us to compromise any SAP installation in the world in the most exposed service and I'm going to show you some examples of how to exploit this to actually take control of the victims and the HTTP and the actual uh, applications. So first, the, my first example is going to be using HTTP request smuggling, and I'm going to use the NWA endpoint, which is present again in all SAPs, and it's used to redirect any user to the login URL, and it provides two really interesting features. First, an open re redirect which will allow us to set anything we want in the relocation host by using the host header. As you can see I can place the attacker <coughs> uh, the attacker host in the in the host header and this will be reflected in the location header of the response. This is actually a feature. This is not a vulnerability by itself because it cannot be exploited by itself. And also we have a parameter reflection which will allow us to reflect anything we place in the body of the request um, in the query string of the relocation URL. Again, you can see that the uh, line breaks are, re are replaced with spaces. So, how can we combine this with the, the synchronization vulnerability to take control of big team's request and also to take control of big team's session cookies? Well, first, the attacker will send a payload which will smuggle uh, an entire uh, request and as you can see the first part it will be forwarded entirely by the proxy as one isolated request it will be split in the ICM and the first part will be resolved by the internal handler and the response will be sent back to the attacker. But the rest of the request which is the smuggled one uh, will be stay in the ICM and this is because the content length states that there should be a hundred bytes of body but we didn't send anything in the body. So it will wait for more data. Also you can see this is a post request to NWA and the host header is uh, evil.com so that's a host controlled by the attacker. Now when a victim sends a request to the, to the proxy, the proxy will just forward this and in the ICM this will be concatenated to the smuggle message that we injected and so the first hundred bytes of the victim's request will be used as part of the body of this request. And if you remember, the, the NW endpoint will allow us to generate a response in this case that will redirect the, the victim to evil.com and it will send also in the, in the query string of the request the first hundred bytes of its original request, which in this case also contains the cookies. So when this is received by the victim browser, the, the browser will send another request but in this case to evil.com which is controlled by the attacker and so the attacker will receive this request which will contain also the cookies from the victim. Now we will be able to hijack as many, requ as many requests as, as many cookies and sessions as we want but for each of these uh, requests that we hijack we will need to send a new request. Okay? So Something that is really special about this vulnerability is that we are not using uh, any, any kind of request that is invalid. So any proxy will see this and it will say okay this is completely RFC compliance. We are not sending any header or anything strange. And so this means that we will be able to replicate the attack and to send it using a form. An HTML form or, and also JavaScript. So the idea is as you can see in the slide. I created a form that will send a request to an SAP system that will be resolved by an internal handler, in this case the admin handler. And <coughs> it will also contain a padding to make this request a long request. And finally, at the end, it will place the smuggle request. So when a victim receives this form, the JavaScript will auto it will submit this, this form again. And so the attack will be sent by in this case, not from the attacker, but from the victim. So now the victim became the attacker and this will continue as long as we actually it will continue forever 
because the attack, the victims will, when making a request to the SAP, will receive again the, the payload, will be redirected to edible.com, and then again send the attack. Okay, so again we can place this in the evil.com. Uh, that's, that's the idea. Also, we can use the same kind of attacks when we find a vulnerability that does not require any invalid or forbidden header, like the one found last year in HI proxy. Uh, so we can use in this in those cases DNS rebinding to be able to send those extra headers, but we can use this technique in many other ways. And if you saw last uh, yesterday's uh, talk from James Kettle, you might think this is a really similar technique because we're actually using the, the same technique or the same idea. And even though the vulnerabilities, the nature of the vulnerabilities are different, we found that it is possible to cause this client side desynchronization. So we are not only going to be able to persist the attack and create a uh, smuggling botnets, but also exploit the browser server this, uh, connection. So we will be able to desynchronize um, even s systems that are not using a proxy. <coughs> this is a really new idea and yesterday James provided a new methodology. It was a really great talk. I recommend that. And so as I said, we can exploit this even without a proxy and we could use social engineering if we are not able to reach the server to send this attack by, with phishing so we can send this form and we, even without sending uh, the first request, we will be able to attack and desynchronize the entire system and obtain the session cookies. So let's see a small demo. Okay, so in this demo, the, the first tab is going to be the client. And as you can see, when, send, when the client sends a request to start page, he will just receive the 200 response. Nothing strange here. As many times as he wants, he will receive the same response. And he's including the cookies in this request. Now, when the attacker sends the, the payload, which, con, which is going to be resolved by an internal handler, and it's a long request, we will be able to smuggle another message and inject what is at the end, which is the post request that we already saw, the post to NWA. This will be stored in the ICM until more data arrives. So again, when we send this, we just receive a response. We don't care about that response. And when the victim sends a new request, instead of receiving a 200, he will receive a redirection to the evil.com server. And now again, he will be sending, when, when he follows this redirection, he will be sending his own credential, his own cookies. And therefore, we will be able to obtain uh, these cookies and of course, the session, the secret session of the, of the victim. And what we are going to see now is that when he follows the redirection, the evil.com server, or in this case, it's another server, I don't remember the name, uh, is going to return this form that I already explained. So the browser will send an, another attack and this will keep the, the attack and the exploit running. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this is another exploit I'm going to explain. Uh, this technique is ki kind of advanced, so I explained this, these ideas last year in DEFCON. It's called response smuggling. And what we're going to try is to poison a web cache proxy. So anytime we have a web cache proxy in the middle of us and we have a desynchronization vulnerability, we are going to be able to use this technique. I'm going to try to explain really fast. If you don't really understand this, you can see my last year talk and I guess that will make uh, this clear. So the attacker is, in this case is going to send two get requests. Actually, the proxy will see two get requests. But when they are forwarded to the back end, which in this case would be the ICM, they will be, the first one will be split into three, into three different requests. And in this case, they will not be in complete requests as we already saw, like with a content length uh, being a big content length without a body, but instead we are going to smuggle three complete requests. Now, as you can see, the, first, the, the proxy saw that there were two get requests, but in this case, the ICM saw that the first request is a get, the second one is a hit, this, the third one I don't care and the third one is a, uh, the fourth one is a get. So you all know that the head request is special because when you send this, this kind of request to a, to a server, what we are going to receive is the same response that we would get for a, for a get request, but, in, but instead in this case, we are only going to receive the headers. 
What you might not know is that the RFC allow the servers to send also a content length and this is almost always true. You will see this in this behavior in almost any server and the content length even though one would expect to be zero because the body is empty is not. It's the same one as the as the content length which would be if we would have issued a get request. Therefore in this case we will see that is uh, quite quite longer than zero it's like 3000 something. So how is uh, how are the proxies going to know that they should ignore this content length header? Well because they know that they had forwarded a head request and therefore when they receive the response for this head request they know that this content length shouldn't be used to generate the response and to to know the body the length of the body of the response. But if you see in the slides you can also see that this proxy didn't saw the head request. Therefore he doesn't know that the content length should be ignored. So the first response will be sent to the attacker as always uh, is the get the response for the first get request but now the second response <coughs> is going to be used for a get request and in this case the content length will be used because the proxy doesn't know this is a, a head response and so it will use part of the next uh, response as the body. So it will use the headers of the next response as part of this of this body and also the rest. Um, and we can build a lot of payloads out of this. We can use this to actually generate malicious responses that contain JavaScript. We can change the, the content type of different responses. So we have, if we have a response where we can reflect data, like text plane, uh, and we cannot use this to generate an exploit, well, this can be used to change the content type. Also, we, if, we are, if we are able to do, uh, reflect some data or something in the, in the headers of the response, we can also use this as part of an HTML body. And also, <coughs> you will see that this response only also contains a, a cache control header. So if we choose a head request that the response give us a cache control header, then we are going to be able to poison the cache with this malicious response. And the, the request and the URL that's going to be poisoned is also chosen by the, by the attacker. And we can choose any kind of URL we want. So we can arbitrarily to, uh, modify any record in the web cache. And we can store this payload there so that then when the client request uh, generates a request for the same URL, the proxy will not forward this but instead it will send what is stored in the, in the cache. Now we are also going to see a demo. Oh. Well, I don't know where the demos are. Can I have some help here? <laughs> ah, it should be there. Yeah, it should be there. There it is. Sorry for that. Okay. <coughs> now, in this demo, we are going to see how we can poison and modify the web cache of any of any proxy. I created an exploit that is going to poison any any URL we want with a specific payload in this case it's going to generate a, a, a JavaScript that will generate an alert. <coughs> so the idea again I, I use this payload to modify any URL we want and generate this and inject a uh, malicious response uh, for that specific endpoint. And I can use this attack for something even better which is to modify the login page of uh, of the SAP. So the idea is if we can modify anything we want then why not modifying the URL that is uh, used for login so that when a user uh, loads this or use this uh, this HTML it will actually send the, the credentials back to the attacker instead of the SAP and then we can redirect the, the victim to another login with extra queries Query string parameters so that it doesn't use the cache version. So now again, as I said, I'm going to replace the login URL. This is always going to be used by any any SAP user to log into the application. So we start a server that is going to be li listening to to what this uh, this login sends. So again, this 
looks like the original login, nothing strange, the URL is still the same, nothing that the user can detect. And when he sends the, the credentials, instead of being sent to the, to the SAP, they will be sent to the attacker. Well, again, it's a repetition just to show that this will work anytime we want, and this will be stored in the cache, so this will work for, without sending any other payload, this will keep working. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so then I said, well, if I found a vulnerability like this, then I want to learn more about the ICM, and I want to learn how the more complex requests are processed. And then I found that the ICM can be configured both for Java or ABAP, I know I knew that, but that there is a difference. When we configure the ICM for Java for Java, we are going to see that the <coughs> the HTTP server accepts pipeline requests by default. But when we configure it with uh, ABAP, this needs to be configured. So we are going to see the Java, this is what this will work for ABAP if it's configured for pipeline. So pipelining means that we are going to be able to receive a request that contains two, actually a payload that contains two requests and the ICM will be able to split them. Now these are completely valid and legit requests uh, that can be split using the content length and the, the, there is nothing strange uh, of, from this request. Now the process will be the same. The ICM worker thread will reserve a new MPI buffer. It will store the request there it will then the HTTP parser will be called and the HTTP parser will recognize that there is an extra request. So it will reserve a new MPA buffer and it will place the rest of the request there. Now the ICM worker thread will continue processing the first one. It will send the request to the Java process. <coughs> the Java process will generate the response. It will place it in the shared memory, send the reference to the worker thread and the worker thread will forward the response. Then both MPI buffers will be freed and the request response cycle will be completed so the ICM worker thread will be able to continue processing the next pipeline request. So remember I said that uh, there is a, a strange condition when we send multi-buffer requests, okay, so long requests, and that is that uh, the buffers are going to be freed, all, by w all, all the buffers are going to be freed using the same function. So what if we send a pipeline request with a long request before? So again, in this example, we are sending a long request and at the end, a new, a new request. So when the worker thread receives this, it will place the first one in the MPI buffer. It will call the HTTP parser, it will call the handlers. And then <coughs> when, the, when the worker thread is ready to send the request to the worker process, which is the Java process, it will place the rest of the request in a new MPI buffer. But now, the HTTP parser will also recognize that there is an extra request and it will reserve a new MPI buffer and place the extra request there. Now everything will continue as we expect. This will be sent to the Java process. The Java process will generate the response, send it to the ICM. The ICM will forward the response. But now, remember, we, we have a long request. So therefore, we are going to use the MPI free all buffers to free this, all, all these buffers. And this is going to free all the buffers associated with the worker thread, including the pipeline one. So now, the, th the three first references will be lost, but not the one with the pipeline request because free all buffers does not uh, remove uh, references. So this means we will be able to use a request that is inside a free MPI buffer, and this will cause some some problems. Of course, if this is uh, if if the worker thread tries to send this to a Java process, this will generate an error because the work the MPI handler knows that this worker thread does not have any uh, reserve buffer, so this will generate an error and we will not receive a response. <coughs> but what if, the, uh, what, what would happen if uh, a client, another client from another TCP connection, sends a request while we have the reference to this uh, free MPI buffer? So the worker thread will actually reserve the same MPI buffer and we will have a reference to another's connection uh, buffer. This can be a real problem and I'm going, to see, I'm going to show you why, but first let me say that <coughs> this is going to happen a lot of times because the, the MPI handler will store the free buffers in a stack 
even though SAP states that this is a queue, when I reverse engineering the, the component, I understood that this is a stack, therefore the, the last free buffer is going to be used in the next, uh, in the next iteration. So this means that the worker thread 2 will, re will write on top of our request and you might think okay we can use this to obtain a response that is intended for our, for our another client. This is not true, we still have the problem of the MPI handler knowing that we don't have a, a reserve buffer. So what we are going to try to do is to write on top of a victim's request. And to do so we are going to send a pipeline request that is not completed. And this can be done by sending a request which does not contain two line breaks after the headers or that contains a body that is shorter than the message length header states. So when this happens, the, the worker thread will be set to read mode, it will wait for more data, and once this data arrives to the ICM, it will be, it will be written in the same buffer at the end of the last, uh, at the last position that uh, the worker thread wrote in a byte. So you can see that if we send to the, the request in two parts, the, they will all be, the, all the data will be written in the same buffer and that the offset will be up, updated. <coughs> so the idea in this case will be we are going to try to tamper the victim's request and make him obtain a different response that he, the, that the one he expected. Again we are going to send a long request with a pipeline request that is going to <coughs> hijack an, a new, uh, that is going to create a new buffer you can see the MPI buffer at the top. The first request is going to be resolved. Okay, it will send the response back to the client. And now the MPI free all buffers will be called. All the buffers will be freed. And so <coughs> then we, we have hijacking, we have a, an extra buffer, an extra reference to this buffer. But this is a free buffer. Therefore, other worker threads could use it. And when the parser tries to read this, the, the request we sent, which is just uh, an extra byte, an X, it will see that this is an incomplete request and therefore it will be set into the read mode and wait for more data. And if we are lucky enough, another, another worker thread will reserve this buffer and will place the request of a, of a victim. Now, at this point, we will try to send more data so that this data is written in the same post in the same place or in this uh, hijacking buffer. And then we are going to uh, write in the second position because the worker thread one thought that the only byte that was uh, in this, in this uh, buffer is an X. Therefore it will start writing in the second position. And we will be able to tamper all the, all the requests from the victim. Actually not the first byte but the rest of the, of the request. So then when the worker thread two forwards the or send the MPI pointer to the Java process, the Java process will use this request and will generate the malicious response. Then it will place it in the MPI buffer, forward it to the worker thread two, and the worker thread two will send this to the victim. So the steps to reproduce this attack again is the attacker needs to hijack a buffer. This is easy and is deterministic. The victim will send a request and the, the request will be placed in the same uh, MPI buffer. This is not that is, uh, I mean, this is not deterministic, but it happens a lot. The attacker then will tamper the victim's data or the victim's request and the victim will receive the malicious response. As you can see in the example, when a victim, sometimes when a victim sends a, a request to start page, he will receive instead of the 200 response, a redirection to evil.com. <coughs> This attack does not require a proxy, just as I already explained, because we are, we are uh, tampering another TCP connection, so we can uh, launch this attack with or without a proxy. But maybe you are also wondering why some of these responses does not, does not contain a uh, status code. And that is because the, the buffers are multipurpose. This means that we can use the same buffer for requests and responses. So in those cases, we are not tampering a request, but instead we are tampering a response. <clears throat> so the idea, and this is going to be the, the best idea for, for it to use this, uh, this vulnerability, is to, instead of tampering a request, we are going to try to tamper a response. And I'm going to show you why. Again, we have, high, we have a buffer, a free buffer, uh, and we have a reference to it so we can write more data. And we are going to wait for, a, for another client to send a request. Now, in some cases, 
the worker thread will not use the same buffer that we already uh, that we have a reference to, but instead a new one. And that is because of just because of timing. Uh, if the worker thread has uh, has sent the, the is the client of the worker thread to send a request when we are when we do not have a reference to a free buffer, but instead to a to a reserve buffer, then the uh, worker thread two will use a new one. So in this case, the worker thread two will just place the request in this new MPI buffer. This will be sent to the Java process. The Java process will generate a response for this. And this response, in this case, will be stored in the same MPI bu buffer that we have our reference to. So now we are able to write in the same buffer that the worker process placed the response. Okay. So if at that point we are able to send more data, this data will tamper the response and therefore we will be able to write whatever we want in the in the response. Okay? So we are going to be able to generate any response we want and to exploit uh, this as by injecting any script, any headers, anything we want. Now when this response is received by the worker thread 2, the response parser will be called and it will, the, it will forward the response to the client. But then the cache handler, response cache handler will be called also. And if you see the MPI buffer that I, that, that is in the slide, you might notice that there is an extra header that you might not know, which is called SAP cache control header. This is an internal cache, uh, this is an internal header that is going to be used and is going to be used by the cache handler to know if the response should be stored or not. So what we are going to do is to place this so that <coughs> the response for this is stored in the internal cache. And now we can modify any, any resource we want with an arbitrary response. If we play the role of the worker thread 2, instead of waiting for a victim to send this request, we can choose which of the URLs are going to be modified. And so we can modify any URL with anything we want. In this demo, I'm going to sh do ex the exact thing as I just explained. <coughs> In this case, we are not using a uh, proxy, we are just attacking the ICM. We can do it with a proxy. We can encapsulate the same attack using the previous vulnerability I explained. <coughs> and so this exploit is going to try to hijack a buffer, send a lot of requests that will generate a response, a lot of, a lot of requests in this case to start page because we are trying to poison the start page in the internal ICM cache. And so this will require a few attempts. Of course, this is not deterministic, but it is quite reliable. As you can see, we are going to try to do it a few times. This script will adjust the times and it will also verify if the, if the response has been modified in the cache just by requesting the start page and seeing the, the response. And after a few attempts, yeah, after a few attempts, we, we got a successful attack. And what's important about this is if we have one successful attack, then this will be persisted. So, uh, with one attack, we will see that all the clients that request the start page will receive this, uh, this response, which is uh, an arbitrary response with an arbitrary HTML. Okay, finally, I'm going to try to explain this really fast. We can also use this attack <coughs> to uh, cause a, buff a buffer overflow in the heap and eventually obtain remote command execution. This can be done. So remember, I said we are going to tamper our response. But in this example, we are not. We are. We have not tampered the response already. The the worker thread to generate a request, which generates a response that contains a SAP cache control header already. Okay, this is a valid response. When the worker thread to receive this response, it will use the response parser. It will send the the client the, the request the response back to the victim or to the client, and then the cache handler will be called. The cache handler will store this in uh, and actually going to be stored. Uh, the response is going to be stored in a in a file in the file system. And first, the cache handler will set some headers in this in the file, which uh, contains the length of the entire response. And if we are able to tamper the the, the response at this, this exact point, 
then we are going to be able to force the cache handler into uh, placing the, re the, the malicious response in this file, which is not this, uh, which does not contain the same length that the hero states. Okay. So when another client requests this uh, poison uh, resource, the request cache handler will look in the cache, it will find a response, and it will use the headers <coughs> of the cache file to create a, a buffer in the heap. And then it will write all the data in that, in, in that heap, in that buffer. But as the data is longer than these 85 bytes, then we are going to be able to write over and write other data structures in, this, in the heap. We have demonstrated, I, I know and we have demonstrated that it's possible to obtain remote code execution, only uh, it's, uh, the, the only problem is we need to uh, defeat the randomization. Okay, so SAP <coughs> released uh, two, two patches for this, uh, for all their systems. They must be applied in any system uh, using SAP uh, because it's part of the SAP kernel. And the two CVEs, which is the first one is a CVSS 10 uh, for the first vulnerability. The second one, the use after freeze 8.1. Uh, in this case, they said that the, uh, <coughs> at, um, the complexity of the attack is high and the scope is unchanged. We disagree, but that's how they, they saw it. And also, it's important to see that it can be used in any SAP in the world. Also, there are some workarounds that can be implemented in NetWeaver and Web Dispatcher, and we provided a tool uh, that can be used to detect the attack. So finally, some conclusions. <coughs> we, saw, we saw that uh, HTTP servers are really interesting targets, and this is because we can use, we can use reverse engineering by uh, but using the RFC in, in our mind, okay, we, can know, we know that this HTTP server must follow the RFC, so it's easier to understand what the, what the HTTP server is doing. <coughs> also, they have similar functionalities, and we can use the requests and responses and locate them in memory to know uh, what we can modify and what not. And we also saw many talks that are using different attacks, like the, the one presented yesterday by Orange, which is use uh, which is in IIS but again we see that these attacks in HTTP servers are increasing so it's really important to, to understand them and to keep looking for new new vulnerabilities. Also uh, it was interesting to demonstrate that we can escalate low level vulnerabilities with uh, HTTP exploitation and this includes this new techniques called client side desynchronization and also we can use DNS rebinding to bypass some VPNs and to leverage other attacks that in the past were not possible to, to be exploited. And finally, <coughs> I want to say that uh, ICMAT is the, is the code name of the vulnerabilities, was added by the uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency of the US. Uh, they, all these vulnerabilities had a critical impact because the components that were, that, that were exposed or that were vulnerable were exposed to the internet and were present in all SAP installations uh, SAP stated that these were uh, one of the worst uh, vulnerabilities uh, that they ever found or that they ever fixed. And so, <coughs> uh, and this is also because we are finding a vulnerability in a really exposed service, which is HTTP and HTTPS. Questions? Thank you.